Hello, um, welcome to this conversation that was made possible by Black Tech Fest in Utah, the United Tech um, and Allied Workers Union. Um, I'm Tiana Barrett, a undergrad computer science major at Howard University, and I have the honor of interviewing Dr. Timney Gebru, but please uh, introduce yourself as well. Uh, I am the Tamit, and uh, I am the founder and executive director of the Distributed AI Research Institute. It's um, an interdisciplinary um, AI research institute that I founded last year. So yeah, let's get to it. Okay, great, great. Um, so our first question is, um, after the Black Lives Matter 2020 protests, many companies claim to care about fighting racism. Uh, did you see any shift in how they accounted for the risk of AI? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's the short answer is no. Um, right when the protest happened, there was a lot of talk. Um, there were a lot of meetings, uh, emails. We stand with our Black Plus. Um, I don't know what Black Plus means. So there, they had all these emails. We stand with our colleagues, um, and for the most part, they were acting like the problem was not in their companies, you know, that they were acting like, oh, and we've donated this much money to this thing, and uh, so that, w that was kind of how they were um, acting, and, you know, I wrote my, um, so the protests were in, you know, June, right, June 2020, and um, around that time was a, a large language model that was released by a company called OpenAI. So there's GPT-2 or 3 at the time. There's GPT-3 now, but at the time, I think, I don't remember if it was 2 or 3. I think it was GPT-3, actually, yes. And um, I remember an email chain where people were super excited by, oh, my God, like, look at how, um, how, impressive it is it generates language that like sounds so human and I was like also it generates language that's super racist and sexist and so like people just kept on um, discussing in the email thread as if I didn't say anything and I was like hello I just made this comment and like, and then they're like, you're so rude and this one guy and I said, you know, and also, you know, it's trained um, using Reddit which oh, I never venture into because obviously get harassed if you're a black woman and read it. And I wrote this guy wrote back and was like, oh, I, I'm not surprised that you are harassed on Reddit. You're so rude and all of this. And I was like, we're in the middle of Black Lives Matter protest. You're talking about this tool. And I'm trying to tell you that there is also one issue maybe that you can con you can consider. And then, you know, I'm the problem. So this kind of like encapsulates how tech companies have been um, reacting to AI or any other issues of diversity after Black Lives Matter protests. In, in the, in, initially, they just kind of said they were going to donate all this money to other stuff because they're good, right? They're not the problem. They're going to donate to like outside of uh, their corporations. Um, and then I got fired in December 2020, right after Black Lives So this was during that whole thing. You know, I had assembled a team of people to um, working on AI and research at Google to um, to then look at the issues and what we're dealing with, come up with recommendations. We did all this work and we did all the, this presentation to the research organization, which um, was like the second most watched um, presentation, I believe. And all that, right? And then, you know, they didn't take any of our recommendations. They started talking about mentorship. I'm like, who asked for mentorship? Nobody asked to be me mentored. That's not what we're asking for. We're asking for getting rid of the barriers that you place um, on us. So, and I, I think Cheryl Dorsey actually had um, written about this, about like the commitments that all these different corporations made and whether they followed through or not. And surprise, surprise, you know. <laughs> we, we're already dealing with the backlash right that's the thing you just one little thing happens all these people protest you catch people's attention for one second 
and that's already set us back like 10, 20, 30, 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. We're already dealing with the backlash. We cannot have any kind of visibility without getting so much of the backlash. Yeah, exactly. And I guess uh, like a little bit about myself too. I was working as a step intern during like the 2020 protests and definitely like just seeing how much was going on and then having to log into work to like code for the day was just like a such a weird disconnect. So yeah, I, I, and now like they celebrate like Juneteenth, which is like an American holiday about emancipating slavery and everyone gets the whole day off. And it's, I don't know, it's like you said, they choose the easiest surface level option to kind of make it seem like they care, but more structurally and more radically cool change they definitely shy away with and actively like repress oh don't even let's not even go to radical mm -hmm. that's not that's never going to happen inside corporations but just even you know small 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 things like don't retaliate against us um don't make hr do this 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 mm -hmm. it you know it is really really interesting to see how um they won't do anything um it's 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 just they're just not going to change i mean that's that's what i've come to understand they're not going to change it has to come you know some pressure needs to happen right the unionization i have a lot of you know a lot more faith in those kinds of avenues than uh, that force you know kind of worker forward that forces corporations to change rather than expecting them to do something of their own volition they have to be forced to do it hmm. Yeah, well, that I think that kind of leads to um, some of the student questions. So for context, um, as a Howard University computer science student, I asked some of my peers and um, professors that I work with that they had questions because we were all like fangirling and like, oh my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> talk to her, that's really cool. Um, so I guess um, uh, one question um, that Akosua had, um, is while there certainly is a lack of laws, policies, and standards um, on ethical AI regulations, what piece of law or policy regarding the use or creation of technology concerns you at the moment? What piece of law, like the, the inexistence of the law or the existence of the law? Um, I believe maybe more of, is there an upcoming policy or law related oh. to technology that's concerning that you've uh, well paid so the the biggest concern is that there is nothing and so imagine if you have people building bridges that can just spontaneously be set on fire and it's fine you know that's mm -hmm. kind of where we are right now and not only that um they think it's better if they don't find out beforehand that it spontaneously sets on fire and also even after it's built they think it's better for them legally if they don't investigate whether it spontaneously you know just gets on fire set on fire or not that's that's where we are right now right so when you look at any type of tech companies they're unregulated they're not like other industries other industries food toys anything you can imagine there's some amount of regulation these companies are completely unregulated. So in my opinion, they're making their money because of that. They're making tons and tons of money that they shouldn't be making because of that, because they're not appropriately compensating people who create the data that they that they are using to train their models that are proprietary. Um, they're not appropriately compensating. There's a lot of labor exploitation. Um, there's an upcoming article that we wrote we in in our institute about how labor exploitation is what drives quote unquote ai because at the entire end of the ecosystem you have you know data laborers that are paid nothing peanuts or content moderators or something like that and so there's there's just um and they don't have to take the safety measures and the testing and all of this stuff in place so they don't have to put resources into that and if they are not required to put resources into that they're never going to do it right because you're basically telling someone to um 
to make less money and and put more resources into making things safe and that only happens when when there's regulation so to me right now how it works is you know they want plausible deniability so they'll say you know if you um if you don't find out that there's a problem uh, if you can't fix the problem it's better not to find out that there's a problem because legally then you won't be held liable so the fact that that's where we are is is highly concerning to me we should be in a in the in the exact opposite um situation where they get punished if they don't investigate the problems that's what we want we don't want laws that you know encourage them not to investigate the problems so that's that's basically kind of for me um the the biggest issue is the lack of any kind of regulation and the speed with which um people are spewing out new and new models <coughs> with even more and more data from people so there's a new there's a new uh, class of models now that um generate images from captions and um a lot of people are using them and there already people using them commercially they're building you know commercial products out of them and a lot of these are trained on data from artists that they never they never consented to giving the, all their work right that they never consented to um to giving for this training there is like forget that that's a new thing right but forget that we, we haven't even regulated stuff from like 10 years ago and so the mismatch between how fast these things go and are proliferated and the lack of regulation makes it such that the people who are most impacted by these things like black people we don't get to imagine the future right we don't get to be in this imaginative process of what do we want to build for ourselves we're always in this kind of horrible cleanup phase of trying to raise awareness about the harms and kind of do something about them and while we're doing that they've moved on to like the next thing with again full speed and absolutely no repercussions so to me that's that's really um at the crux of it right um in in the US there is done in the in EU they have the AI act that's coming up um and a lot of people are debating it um and so it's it has some for instance um uh, kind of things about high risk um high risk use of of AI like um law enforcement and things like that in the US there there are a bunch of cities and this is the sad thing i thought we were making some strides in terms of face recognition because there are some cities in the US that are that were banning the use of face recognition technologies by law enforcement um but then now this it's the opposite the the you see little bands on the one arm with one arm and then you see proliferation of the technology everywhere with another arm um if you're looking at you know the, the electronic border wall um so in 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 the europe it's fortress europe right and in the us at the, the us mexico border and they have all of this these drones um um image recognition face recognition all this stuff to just police you know migration um which is a human right so these are all the things that are considering uh, that are concerning to me on the one hand there's no regulation of 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 any type of how these um technologies are proliferated on the other hand the the state that you want to regulate these things is also using them for such horrible things um i don't know it's it's <laughs> it's depressing yeah so like <laughs> like you said short answer the concern is that there's a huge lack of concern <laughs> in regulations and laws especially in the US wow mm -hmm. um okay um so the next question is um What are your thoughts on the threat of rogue AI and kill switches or similar programs to stop them? Um this is from Kevin. Um and I guess also my input it kind of reminds me of like that big thing on Twitter that happened where um someone who worked at Google was saying that the AI that they're working with is sentient and oh, I remember, yeah, yeah. Like, a oh, lot of God. people were talking about that. So, yeah. <laughs> I wrote an op-ed about that on the Washington Post. and my op-ed said that no it's not sentient or conscious or whatever or super intelligent and that just basically 
derails us completely into the fact that the biggest story on AI that I can imagine in the last few months was that really makes me sad because that is not what we should be talking about, right? So um, a lot of especially rich white men um, are extremely enthralled with this idea of a rogue AI, you know, being that you create that just like Terminator kind of scenario, right? And that's not the pro the issue. Um, it, it's very weird, actually. Like they have this this on the one hand, they talk about AGI, which is artificial general intelligence, which is a, a very it's not a defined a well defined thing. But it sounds kind of like a god to me when you think about it. It's like, oh, we want to build this all-knowing, super intelligent being that can do what humans can do and more. And it's going to bring us utopia. Like, that's how they talk about it. And then I'm like, okay. But then they say, oh, it's also an existential risk to humanity because it can destroy humanity and all of that. I'm like, then why are you trying to build it? You, you just said it was going to bring us utopia and that it's going to be this thing. Why are you? So then the way they say it is like, okay, like we're the good ones. So if you give us all the money, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of like build the good kind, but you got to give us all the money. So we build the good kind. If we don't build the good kind, China's going to build the bad kind. That's mm -hmm. kind of like the bad kind of the existential risk type. And also you got to give us money to build it and also make it safe. To, there, so there's a field called AI safety, which I hate because it's all the white guys um, talking about AI safety. They don't talk about structural issues like racism, sexism, coloni colonization, or anything, colonialism, right? They'll just like in the abstract talk about these, you know, futuristic um, scenarios that are fun to think about for them. And with so much money. Um, but that's not, that's not what um, we should be talking about. We should be talking about the humans. So AI is a tool, it's a system that's created by humans, right? So when you ascribe sentience and things like that, you start basically not holding the giant systems of humans that build it accountable. So you have corporations, governments, military, all of these entities building these harmful products, right? And so they're building this harm for products that can be regulated, that can be tested, that can be, um, you know, not built. Um, and then, so on the one hand, you have the builders, on, and then there are all of these myriads of exploited people for each uh, AI system. So there's all these people behind this supposedly sentient AI. There's people's data. There are people who are labeling um, the training and the testing, evaluation, etc. data who are underpaid or not or not paid at all completely exploited and then on the other end you have the people who are being harmed by these systems right um like some of the you know migration like i said um black and brown people mostly whether it is through the bombs and the drones or the, just the militarization of borders or uh of and they use the same kind of surveillance techniques like the the drones a lot of some of the um, drones that are deployed in the U.S. Mexico border are uh, bought from Israel, like from by Israeli companies that were being used on Palestinians, right? And then those same drones were being used on Black Lives Matter protesters as well. So it's all of these people, um, black and brown people around the world, who are being harmed by these systems, and also those are the people who are whose exploited labor is driving this quote-unquote AI, right? Um, they're actually doing all of this underpaid, low-paid um, gig work um, training these systems. So when we ascribe sentience to this thing um, or when we talk about the machine going rogue or whatever, we're completely discounting all of the humans in the system, whether it is the humans who build it, the humans who are harmed by it, and the systems that can be held accountable, right? So it's very good for um, companies or um, entities in general, governments who don't want to be held accountable to talk about rogue AI because you're not, they're like, well, it 
just went rogue. I don't know what to do, right? Like, because you're not holding them accountable. You're just now ascribing all agency to this ma machine, which is extremely dangerous because then you're not, you know, you're not building systems of accountability. You're just kind of assuming that this machine is going to go rogue and who knows what they'll, what it'll do rather than ascribing responsibility to the builders of the machines. Yes. Wow. Yeah, I definitely have to like <laughs> stop to that. That's yeah, great like framing of that question. Um okay, so next question is um how have you seen um trust and action oriented solidarity in hostile work environments? Um and do you think having um an organized set of workers and companies would help push companies in the right direction? So Alphabet Union, for example, but also Utah, their greater work as an example. Yeah, I think that, you know, um, I definitely push for people to um, unionize, um, have some amount, some type of worker power. And unions have to be, you know, you have to do a lot of work to keep them accountable to people and make them healthy, right? It doesn't mean that you just unionize and it's, uh, the, the work is done, right? You, you have to the 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 work is having some form of worker power and solidarity and and having some way of collective action and um i think that's the only way that's the only way to force companies to to change um to negotiate to fight for some amount of worker power because for example right now uh google and amazon um workers are fighting against a project called Project Nimbus, um, which is a contract with the Israeli military. Um, and so that, you know, and the union, Alphabet Workers Union, is also a part of it. Uh, Ariel Koren just um, resigned after retaliation. So, you know, um, so I think that otherwise, what happens? What, hap what happens if you don't have collective action? How are, you, how are you even going to talk about anything being ethical, right? If you object to something that is being done, you're going to be retaliated against with a heavy, heavy hand, right? And so then you're worried about your livelihood, your well-being. How are you even going to push for any kind of accountability for the larger system? And so that allows, it's just, it's worker power that allows you to do that because otherwise you there is such a huge power imbalance and the courts are a joke, in my opinion, all of these all like because, um, you know, NDA, I don't know if you've um, there's so many. I know there's like a push now, like there's a push to render NDAs illegal and, um, and you know, non-disparagement, non-disclosure clauses because they scare people into silence. Right. And so which which it doesn't even make sense why these things are legal. So I think the only avenue that we have is to have you know, collective worker power to counteract the ridiculous amount of power that these multinational corporations have, which they shouldn't have th that kind of power. And so I think stronger labor laws are actually um, the, the bigger avenue for me towards even, you know, um, combating these harmful AI systems. Because first, um, there is labor that exploited in building these systems. Most people who are involved in building these systems are exploited workers. They're not the, you know, six figure Silicon Valley um, engineers or researchers that are making, that constitute most of the workers involved in these systems. So for, and so if every, if they had to adequately compensate these people, they wouldn't be building all of these just half tested or not tested harmful systems so quickly and proliferating them so quickly because they're building them because they think that it, it's going to make them lots of money. It's going to save them money. Whereas if you have to adequately compensate, you, you'd you be like, oh, that's too expensive. So you wouldn't have so many of these systems because it would be too expensive, right? So on that hand, there's that. On the other end, when people see something unethical, they can speak up. Um, uh, so Polaroid workers, that's an example of how, and how they fought, you know, uh, South African apartheid, um, and how Polaroid pulled out, uh, of, you know, of its, um, kind of collaboration with the government. 
that was the workers who made that happen, right? So when you see something unethical, you can actually have collective action. You can stand in solidarity with someone who is um, unfairly, unjustly fired or targeted or retaliated in some way, because that's the only power that you have as a worker. The company has, it is a, its entire apparatus to keep, you know, the unlimited amounts of money, the unlimited number of um, lawyers to harass you, the PR, the HR people, the whatever, that entire apparatus is for the company, right? And so you only have your, you know, your, your collective um, action with your fellow workers. So I think that is uh, one of the most important avenues to, to go, uh, directions to go to when we are talking about, um, even when we're talking about um, harmful AI systems. Yes, and I think that's a very important point that you made that the people who are overexploited and are most exploited are the largest majority of the workers. And that I think because work is so digitized and we're so independent from each other, it's hard to like build those coalitions and connections. But yeah, that's empowering to hear that there's more of us than there are of them. And that solidarity is a big power move. Yeah, yeah. and it needs to be a cr um, cross-class, um, cross-worker solidarity, right? And that is a thing that tech companies are very afraid of. Um, mm -hmm give an example of this in our article too for example at amazon um they fired um these two women um emily cunningham and i forgot the name of the other one but um they were organizing for a while they were criticizing the company etc the moment there was a meeting between um the tech uh, workers and warehouse workers and delivery workers um, to discuss the conditions that delivery and warehouse workers were dealing with um, in terms of covid within minutes of invites being sent out, they fire them, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I mean, um, because they're too scared of that kind of cross-worker solidarity. Wow, yes, that's great. Oh, okay, I'll go to um, the third question, I guess. Um, actually, this is from one of the professors I work with, Dr. Gloria Washington. Uh, she actually recently got tenured at Howard, so congratulations to her. her. Yeah, yeah, I know her. I know of her. I, I don't think I've met her, but I know of her. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, she asked, um, how do you strike a balance between working on what's right and good for the world, i.e. AI for social good versus working on what pays? Um, oh. And that further connects to how um, HBCUs can learn what by what you've done and what work you've um, been doing to kind of get funding specifically through DARE um, yeah. to build better vision. Yeah, go ahead. It's really difficult. And so that's why I, I um, think about changing systems and incentive structures rather than asking individuals to be sacrificial lambs. Like, why would I tell this person who has a chance to lift their family out of poverty, you know, how all of us have so many people to support and help, right? And, and say, oh, don't go work at big tech, like spend your life, you know, being broke, like somewhere else, right? And so I can't, I can't, <laughs> that I can't do that. And so that's why I, I think about, you know, for instance, the worker, um, the, the, the collective action, so if you work in a large tech company, if you join a union and make sure um, or have some sort of solidarity with other workers, then you can stop them from doing something that is wrong and harmful and, and steer it in, in that direction, right? Um, in terms of um, funding, it's really difficult because the amount of money that Silicon Valley has is dumbfounding. I don't think people understand. I, I, I don't, people still don't understand. Like the people I see who are like starting companies and just $500 million like that to, you know, from that guy, from that random crypto person, from this person, it, then their networks are wild, right? So um, I think that um, it, it, people need to understand that. So the problem is that we don't have that kind of government funding. The only kind of government funding that we have for research is from DARPA, right? That for AI research, that's what they care about. Um, and so we need 
um, much more government funding that is not tied to the military, right? Um, or like DARPA or something like that. We need that. We need that kind of funding because otherwise, how are we going to have you know AI systems that are not leading to like more people, you know, trying to kill more people more efficiently, or um, trying to make as much money as possible at the expense of the global population. So it's 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 so difficult for me to um, to tell individuals what to do because it's the systems that are the problem. And then that here's the other th problem. It's not just oh, thankfully um, she's gotten tenure, but if you're in it, so this is the other reason why I didn't um, I started a my own institute rather than a joining a university is if I'm in a, let's say I'm in the computer science department, I have to have a subspecialty. So my spe specialty is computer vision or, you know, there's natural language processing, robotics or whatever. You have to, um, what if I feel like computer vision should be abolished? Like what if I feel like it's a mm -hmm. harmful field in general and it should just go away? I can't do that as a, as a computer vision researcher at a university and I need to get tenure. Tenure means I have to publish papers in a venue that the OG computer vision people like, right? Because I have to appeal to them. I can't just do, go off and do my own thing. I have to appeal to them. So these incentive structures are not there for me to, to say this thing needs to be. So I think there is also like um, this, uh, you know, a third way that's needed um, to, to have a little bit more freedom to uh, uh, in the kind of research that you're doing and to critique. Um, but so those are for me my things at this point for me I have you know after my um, career in tech I know for a fact I have t taken of course I've taken a huge pay cut you can make so much money being an AI researcher at Google like you can make lots and lots of money the the budget of my entire institute is probably like two researchers at Google right like three you know and so I have done that and um, I made that decision after where, you know, and I have worked in tech for a while, so I'm not, you know, I'm okay financially. I'm not like, you know, I'm not struggling or anything like that. So that's why I, I was able to make that decision because I'm at a time in, a, in my career where I can make that decision. Uh, whereas someone right off of college, it's very, and they have debt, school debt and all of this. So this is why for me, all of these, many of these issues are structural, right? We need to empower people to be able to at least, you know, even if they are not going to be super rich working on um, certain things, we need to empower them to not be uh, broken, miserable for the rest of their life. So debt, you know, they, uh, they should not have debt. Education should be free. Like all of these things, the, the basics just should, should, should be free. And so then people can make, you know, inform more informed choices. Otherwise, they tether you, right? You know, you have to um, pay off your debt, so you have to work at this place. You have to um, get tenure, so you have to do this other thing. So we actually don't get a chance to change the system at all. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, I think that there needs to be a lot of structural changes to enable people to make these choices rather than be tethered. Wow, yes. Um I definitely relate to that a lot um, as I mean, my other fellow students are approaching like graduating what our next steps are. And a very big thing is like, I can feel like a very weird relationship between companies and government agencies coming to specifically HBCU campuses and saying, we're here for you. We want more diversity. Come work for us. You'll make a bunch of money. But like, at what expense? That's always like the hidden yeah. cost behind all those um, decisions. But yeah, <laughs> exactly. At what expense? And like I said, you know, it's um, building a community of people is key and having that solidarity is key. Um, and, you know, you can change a lot as as a collective, right? You can stop the company from doing something, force it to change directions in some way or the other. And that can be very effective locally, wherever you are. There's, it's like pick your poison. Everything you do has an issue. Right now, I created um, a, an institute. I'm happy I did that. 
but I have to be very, very careful about sustainability and not being that tethered to foundations. That's not like <laughs> there. I was just reading a book called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded about the nonprofit and mm -hmm. in, um, industrial complex. Right. And so that's not where I want to be either. So it's just like, you know, you have to really be reflective of you have to think about, OK, what are the issues and whatever I'm doing and how can I combat them? Yes, exactly. Well, I think that's a good segue to a question um, about the D.A.R.E. Institute. Um, if you want to like share more about like the aims of D.A.R.E., um, what work you've kind of mentioned, what work y'all are recently going to be sharing um, more publicly. Yeah, just a little more information for the viewers. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so D.A.R.E. is a distributed AI research institute. We're um, fully remote. Um, we're distributed among, at this point, so let's see, we have someone in South Africa, we have someone in Uganda, we have uh, an advisory board member in Kenya, we have someone, uh, two people in Germany, and we have, um, you know, the rest of us are in the U.S. So it's kind of half-half. Um, um, almost half in the U.S., um, um, a little bit less than half in, um, distributed over Africa, and a couple in, in, in Europe. And, um, and it's a mix of, you know, it's an interdisciplinary research institute, so a mix of social scientists, computer scientists, and organizers, like a labor organizer, um, and, uh, you know, a refugee advocate, um, so we have, we have a mix of people, right? Um, different kinds of, um, and our goal is to work on interdisciplinary research that we believe helps our communities. And especially that would be people, um, black people, uh, people in Africa and the African diaspora. So, um, I want to produce work that is, that in some way positively affects that population and so that means you know when we see the harms we want to uncover and raise awareness about them without being afraid of repercussions and when and but we don't want to be just stuck doing that we also want to show alternative ways of doing things right so for example a big problem is so we're doing fundamental research right and a big problem is that the fund the research process itself is highly extractive and exploitative so what does it mean to have a different process a process that's not like that so we're working on a non-exploitative research philosophy that we're hoping to put out um that we want to abide by right that we want to operationalize um and um so similarly um, in terms of our work, um, you know, there's a number of things that we're working on. Um, there are things like, um, I talked about, I guess, uh, apartheid, right? So one of our projects is using sat satellite images to, um, and, and computer vision techniques to analyze the, um, the impact of spatial apartheid, like how neighborhoods have um, evolved in South Africa um, post-apartheid. I mean, so it's still, basically the same when you look at this you know the the images like you there's a township here townships were created during apartheid right so to to segregate to make sure that black people live in places that um that have very low budgets allocated to them basically and so you know and so you, you still see that kind of segregation and um i guess we're we're also planning on writing an article about it right like releasing our data set, but writing an article urging the South African government to label townships, because in their census, they don't um, label townships. They kind of lump them in with um, formal residential areas. Um, and that's kind of like pretending that they, you know, like that they're diff they're not different, you know, than suburbs. So that's a, one of um, uh, the examples. And so it's just, you know, I think the Institute give us, gives us the freedom to focus on um, specific types of problems that we think are important. Um, we are working on um, a series called 
um, artificial intelligence or labor exploitation. <laughs> so that is mm -hmm. specifically, I mean, it's a rhetorical question. It's basically the latter. Um, and so that's about, you know, um, showing and, and um, educating people about the amount, just the level of labor exploitation that exists in the name of artificial intelligence. And so that people can fight back. Um, so there's, you know, there are a number of projects that we're working on, but I think these two are kind of examples um, of the kind of stuff that we're doing. Wow, that sounds like that's really exciting to you, especially about building philosophies for how to approach um, AI work. Because, yeah, there's nothing out there and people can kind of do whatever they want and make whatever claims they would like. Exactly. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, I guess this leads pretty nicely to a question from Janelle. Um, that I also have struggled with a lot too. Um, some may argue that ethical AI is impossible, at least for the foreseeable future. What would you say to black students in tech who feel as though their efforts in the field are useless? Oh, I mean, I feel that. I am, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I empathize, you know, I relate um, because because it's basically one step forward, 10, 20 steps back. And um, I think it was Liz, Liz Fong, um, who used to be at Google um, and who was pushed out, said something about, you know, I think when she was resigning, she said something like about, I, I, I can't say it quite right, but she said, I can't, it's kind of like, you know, a sinking boat and there's water in the boat and you're trying to get the water out with little, you know, teaspoons or something. <laughs> and the people steering the boat are puncturing ho like holes, more holes, like with huge, you know, and she's like, I can't do that anymore. So, you know, and, um, but the thing is, uh, the doctor, so Professor Sophia Nogle, who's, uh, who wrote the book Algorithms of Oppression, she's uh, also um, an advisor of DARE. And I remember we were on a panel and she said, you know, remember that um, these people who change stuff, there's a, a, a few people, right? Like all the ab abolitionists and things, just like there weren't that many of them, you know? So she was saying that, which is very interesting because every time I think about change, I'm like, oh my God, you gotta get so many people on board, like nothing's gonna change, but you know, you see kind of um, the the huge change that the ripple effect that little things do. And so I would I would um, tell people to focus on small, tangible issues that you are you know, and you can measure the progress. So, for example, um, Ifio Malazoma, right? Um, a friend of mine, she was pushed out of um, Pinterest. And she was, um, she signed an NDA and it was awful. And she broke her NDA. And I mean, that was very courageous of her to do that. Um, and then she helped work, uh, she co sponsored the Silence No More Act in Cal that passed in California, which prohibited NDAs from barring uh, people from talking about unlawful work. Place, um, issues like you know bullying or racism so it was if, before it allowed they had a different one that you know kind of was only for sexual harassment right but there's all sorts of other kinds of issues that you deal with that workplace so that was an a, um, a, a law that passed in California um, and then it was it also passed in Washington State so she focused on a a state law it wasn't like a federal thing um, and uh, this this kind of language that changed, right? But it, it doesn't just affect tech workers. It affects all workers in California. It affects all workers in Washington State. And the big, uh, the major companies are headquartered in these two places, right? And then there's, you know, people now talking about changing it state by state. And then, but it, it's already made huge impact. I've already been seeing um, people speaking up who were either fired or pushed out for specific reasons, and they were they wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for this for this law, right? So she says, you know, um, find something you can do and just do it. Like that's really what she said, and I think it's mm -hmm. true. Um, I you wouldn't have might not have thought that this kind of thing makes a huge impact, but it does. If you're a student, I w at Howard, for example, I would think about 
what needs to change at Howard? What kind of stance to ha does Howard need to, to, to take, right? On which issues? That can have a huge impact because other students then see that and other students replicate it. People in other countries replicate it. Like there's a lot of ripple effects of, you know, the things you do and, you know, you can actually get something done locally because you can organize people, you can measure the impact, you can see whether or not what you're doing is working or not, you know. So that's kind of my recommendation. And um, I, I think that, you know, people should collectively fight for a better future and that we shouldn't expect anyone to be a sacrificial lamb. I think we want people to live their lives and be happy. That's the whole point. Sometimes in these kind of things, in these more activist spaces, it, it kind of feels like people just expect other people to just be drained, you know, like as humans, like, oh, you're, you know, you're not doing this for the movement, you're, you know, and it's like, you want people to li be human and live their lives. That's the whole point, right? Like, why would we be fighting for a better future if we're expecting everybody just be miserable? So I would also remember that, like, you got to live your life, um, enjoy the things you enjoy. Um, you know, leave a lot of space for that. Um, when you need, you know, your boundaries and you need to be away, you need to not talk to anybody, whatever, just kind of don't feel bad about it. Um, and there's ebbs and flows, you know, not everybody can be involved in this kind of stuff all the time. So there's times in your career when I think, you know, you might need, want to just lay low or something like that. And there are times in your career when you might be able to do something. Hmm. Wow, that, that is very encouraging to hear. And it also kind of reminds me of Dr. Ruha Benjamin's new book about viral activism. Yeah, viral yeah, justice. Yeah, uh -huh. justice. Um, that, so that's a very good note to um, end on. Um, I, I guess also you mentioned about wanting to detach. So maybe one quick, happy question, lighthearted question. Um, what do you do to like detach from... Uh, the problems that you focus on a lot and to send to yourself? Um, I am very good at wasting time. <laughs> so I am just very good at just sitting <laughs> quietly. I love going um, to cafes. I actually love um, just for some reason going to a cafe and sitting and quietly and drinking a latte. You know, they call it latte drinking liberal <laughs> whatever it is. But... I, I like doing that, you know, um, just things that, you know, drinking things that make you have to slow down um, and just kind of, you can't, I can't drink it so quickly. It's hot, you know, <laughs> have to, um, and just sit. Um, I like that. Um, I used to dance a lot um, before, uh, I used to go out dancing a lot before the pandemic, social dancing, more Latin dance. Uh, but I haven't done that in a while. I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do it. I'm still, I'm not yeah. ready to, to like do that yet. Um, but you know, just random style. I just like, you know, I'm very much a routine person. It's very f interesting. So like, I just, you know, I won't feel like I've woken up until I have my last, I need to have, you know, it, it does, I don't know why. Um, and I just like having, you know, a routine where I walk from here to there and then I do this other random thing. I don't know, like, um, and so very, very simple things. Sometimes I just sit and listen to music. Sometimes I just sit quiet. I can sit quietly for a long time, just do nothing. Um, some people like my friends just can't, like we would go on vacation one of my friends is writing her to-do list and she's you know and I and I have my aspirational book that I have not read yet but I like still <laughs> think I'm gonna be reading but I have just been lying in the Sun I haven't been doing anything you know so that's what I do <laughs> half the time um, to uh, to relax <laughs> that, that's great oh um, yeah so I guess now I guess our conversation is wrapped up now. I want to thank again on um, Black Tech Fest and um, Utah for hosting this. And thank you, um, Timmy, for um, speaking with me. And yeah, uh, I guess everyone have a great day. <laughs> and yeah, great to talk.